Welcome to another episode of the BTCC Roundup Show. I'm really excited to be joined by one of the superstars of the series and one of the drivers going into these last couple of rounds of the year with a chance of winning the championship. We've got Tom Ingram with us. Hi, Tom. How are you doing? Oh, I'm very good, thank you. How are you? Good. Not too bad. Not too bad. As you can see, now I've taken my glasses off. He was taking the mickey out of my glasses before we went on air because they're... Rightly so. Right. Held together with tape. You have that, got a full granddad spec. No. I am actually a granddad now as well, so it's actually no. I've got the whole the, the full caboodle, if you like. You're living up to stereotype, then, aren't you? <laughs> well, you can't say that and not allow the fans to actually see the glasses. Oh yes, yes, you're that right. Is, actually, that yeah. See, look, that, thank you, Matt Salisbury from Inside BTCC. Here are my glasses. As you can see, they they're heavily taped. They did have some glue on it as well, but that didn't seem to work. But uh, I will take those off. And uh, well, I've got before we get to before we get too into this, yes. Um, I just want to pick up on the facts. Your glasses have clearly been bodged together there. Yes. Yeah. Did you not used to run a touring car team? I did, but uh, anybody who knows me will know that I don't do anything technical. Okay. So don't ever give me a spanner because okay. I won't have it up the right way. Yeah, and well, clearly, by your glasses. That's exactly, that's exactly, right. exactly. So, yeah, no, that, that's it. I'm, I'm not actually sure what I was actually in charge of. Nobody actually really told me. I sort of kept turning up and, and opening a checkbook. And that was about that's about all I did, really. So it's uh, luckily I stopped doing that a couple of years ago. So it's quite well, handy. at least you know your place. I know my limits. It's good to know your limits. Isn't it? <laughs> so anyway, just going back to you quickly. Uh, well, not quickly for the whole session. We're going to talk about you. So uh, I so you've had a great racing career. You know, actually, you're and, and as and, and as we sort of off off camera, we talked about briefly, but you've been racing for 21 years now, since you were eight years old in cadet karting and had eight years in karts, then five years in genetics and another eight years in touring cars. And where's all that time gone? Into my forehead. Look at those <laughs> You could put a big H on there, but you've got to be careful. You might get helicopters landing on it. Well, this is this is my trouble, you see, John. I'm turning into, you know, I'm developing a five head as opposed to a four head. If the is... thing is, if if they come back with any of those big comeback Dracula movies, I reckon you are a standing. Very I mean, I'd, I, I'd watch. I'd watch. Excellent. Well, it turns out after 21 years, I finally found what my career is going into. It's a Dracula impersonation. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> Very kind. Um, yeah, 21 years. I mean, it, it does seem to fly by, especially when I um, only found out I was 29 this year because I, for the last three years, just assumed I was 26. Um, yeah. So have I. Same yeah. with me, really. I just keep hanging yeah, in, but, but it's, it's been a few years now. The trouble is, Sean, you're putting your glasses back together with tape so people can see through that quite quickly. Exactly. Um, I, at least I've still got the face of a... I've still got my baby cheeks, which is half of the good thing. But yeah, it's amazing how uh, quickly uh, time goes by, doesn't it? And especially when you're, um, I suppose when you're in a career based off of milliseconds and tenths of seconds, actually the scary thing is when the years go by, not the milliseconds and tenths. And I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's, I have had a, a great run so far and, I've, and by no means am I looking at this as, as uh, it's coming to an end anytime soon. I absolutely love it. Um, and for years, touring cars has been what I've wanted to do. I've had no interest in Formula One, no interest in single seaters. Um, touring cars is what I've always wanted to do. Well, that's quite interesting because you started out in cadets when you were eight, carried on in carts for eight years, but you did have a, a slight play with single seaters because you were you were in the runoffs for the uh, the Formula Renault Super Stop. See, it's Racing Steps Foundation drives. Yeah, that was it. So yeah, it was. It would have been the end of 2010. So I won the Ginetta Junior Championship in 2010, um, and I got selected to go down to or for a shootout for the Racing Steps Foundation, which at the time um, was the sort of the ladder system that was helping to take single seater drivers and particularly drivers from. The early stages of their single seater career, right the way through to World Series by Renault and the GP2 levels of that. So I got into the final for that. No idea how, but I did. Um, and it was between, uh, I think Oliver Rowland was in there, um, who's gone off to do great things and racing Formula E and, and some amazing stuff that he's done over his career. Um, I think Josh Webster was in there as well. And Josh went off to do a lot of single seater stuff, Porsche Carrera Cup, Super Cup, and all sorts of bits and pieces of that. I can't remember who the last person was. Um, 
but uh, it, it was a great experience. I've never driven a single seater before, so I was completely chucked in at the deep end. Um, but I did really well. I really enjoyed it. It was a day at Rockingham, which was a circuit I loved anyway, which was great. Um, driving a Formula Renault with Fortec, it was um, it was a pretty cool experience. I didn't win it, obviously, hence why I'm sat talking to you guys and uh, not sat on my yacht in Monaco. Um, but it was a uh, it was a great experience. But like I say, for me, the itch was always Terry Carson. Well, is that and, and the reason for that? Because obviously you're a quick driver and you were up against there's probably lots of names in your karting career you've raced against. You've gone on to you know big things in in lots of areas of motorsport, but everybody uh, probably in karting, most people then are looking at single seater route. But the thing, but you're you know you're quite a tall guy. So I mean, when did when did that happen? Because some people it comes, it's always been the same. You know, they've been sort of six foot from the age of twelve, and other people have but suddenly, you know, they were five foot, and then all of a sudden at the age of fourteen, yeah. they suddenly find a foot overnight almost. I was I've been about six foot two since I was about fifteen. So yeah. I was that I was the freak at school. who was the tall, was the weird tall kid. But my trouble is, Sean, I'm tall, but I'm weirdly tall. I'm weird <laughs> in a number of ways. One of my weird ways is I'm six foot two, but I've only got a 31 inch leg. Oh, right. OK, OK. Which is right. bizarre, because what happens is all my length is in my body. So if you ever see me going karting, I look like Donkey Kong because I'm <laughs> sat. The steering wheel's down here somewhere and I'm sat right up there. So in karting, I was rubbish, apart from when it rained. And I was mint. But for the most part, I was heavy because I was tall and... Because I was tall, it was a high centre of gravity, never really did that. Well, I won the British Karting Championships and bits and pieces like that. But again, never really had the money to do it properly. I was always going around nicking tyres out of the bin and stuff. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, really yeah. That, you know, it's, a, it's a difficult sell when you have to steal tyres out of a bin to go racing. So, But but in fairness, it, so I mean, at that age, at eight, it's not going to be you who's taking you around every day. So it must have been quite a big family affair of you all going racing, which, you know, for, for lasting that long, eight years. I mean, it's not cheap, is it? You suddenly work out how to go motor racing and, and it soon needs money for when you're on a, a sort of a normal family budget. Yeah. And, that's, and that's exactly what we, we, we were. Um, it, it was always mum and dad. Mum and dad and I would go around the country racing. So it was always just, you know, dad and lad out of a van, really. Um, and when we were racing against the big teams who had five engines to be throwing at it, sets of tyres and whatever they wanted. And we'd be turning up with old tyres, old engine, old carbs and that sort of stuff. It was always, you're always on the back foot. But you're absolutely right. It was a, it was a family affair for, for, for many years. And it was a passion that came from dad. Dad used to race motocross. and quads. Okay. Basically, anything that involved broken bones and mud my dad was normally all over that. Um, I always think that any, any ex-bike racers, you know they are, because they always walk with a limp. So yeah. they've always got a limp. It's just not... It's, yeah, and anybody says they race bikes, he says you can't have done. You don't walk with a limp, so you haven't raced so, properly. I think, actually, if Dad would have had his way, I'd be on two wheels. Mum oh, okay. clearly got her way, which is why I'm on four wheels. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, uh, that, so I, you know, I still got a passion for... for you know, motorcycle racing and bits and pieces. Like, I really enjoy watching it. But um, yeah, for me, it was it was a it was a passion that was bred from dad. Um, and we'd go around the country as a as a little family. I'm very lucky in the sense that I was an only child. Um, had I had any brothers or sisters, I wouldn't have been racing. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. No, I get that. I get that. And then after karting, you sort of went into the junior, uh, sort of the Ginetta world, which I, I, I mean, uh, Ginetta is one of those sort of unsung heroes for me of motorsport because so many drives have come from yeah. their championships all the way through. And there is, an, there is a real, it, and, and again, it's not one of those companies that's there just to make loads of money. It's actually, well, um, they're there to make money, great, but they're there as every company should be. But they're actually got a real heart in motorsport, you know, and, that, and, and that's proves, and you're one of the probably one of the best examples. Of it. I was, you know, I, I hold a, a, an awful lot of thanks to Lawrence, yeah. um, who looks after Ginetta, because um, uh, a number of steps along the line were, were really down to Lawrence helping me out along the way. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't have been, I, I still wouldn't be in this position without loads of people over the years, of course, but Lawrence was definitely. Um, a large factor to that and keeping me racing and keeping me in a drive. Um, and the junior championship is tough. I mean, the Genetta Juniors is a tough, tough series. When I mean, you've got 14 to 17 year old guys and girls in, 
equal machinery, all with one goal of winning, with no other, you know, with no other aspiration. Second isn't an option. It's a tough championship. And you're absolutely right. They're tough cars to drive. They're difficult cars to drive. Um, but I think what they do is teach you an enormous amount of race craft. And I think they're great for that. If you look at the drivers that have come through Ginetta Juniors over the years, um, you know, Jake Hill and myself were, were from the same year, but you look all the way through, even now, you watch the junior race and it's some of the best racing that's around. And that is oh, yeah. a great foundation for drivers moving forwards to carry on with that because it is, you know, those early years, yes, people say karting is enormously important and it really is. But I think your first in, in, you know, your first step into car racing is probably even more important because that's, uh, that's your, your bread and butter once you start going through the circuits that you're racing on, you know, sat on one side of the car or the other in a junior sense. And, and, and it's, you know, so it's a hugely important part of your career. But you're absolutely right. It, it's produced some some great drivers over the years. If you look at, as I say, Jake and I were from the same year, Jake Hill and I were from the same year, but you look right the way through to, you know, even recent recent years, Jamie Chadwick, Adam Smalley going up and doing great things, Harry King going up and doing great things. There's some fantastic names that have come up for that, and I'm only scratching the surface. Mm. Um, so it's been a, it has been a, a, a great um, a great school for, for, for young guys coming in. That's right, boys. You won the Ginetta Juniors, the G50s, and then the G55s as well in that five-season period. And then you made your step up to touring cars. Um, was that always the target, if you like, for what you were aiming for all the way yeah. through? Yes, it was. I mean, I've um, the, 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 the touring car bug for me came from when I was five years old. Dad took me to the autosport show, and I met Matt Neal. And I looked up at Matt Neal, <laughs> as I still do now, and I shook his hand and I thought, this is really cool. And I, the same day, Dad bought me the, I think it would have been the 1999 season review. Uh, and I used to watch it on videotape, VHS, every day before I used to go to school. Some kids could be playing football, will be on the PlayStations on whatever. I'll be watching races, reruns of, of, uh, of the touring car season. And that's what got the bug for me. That's where the, you know, that that's what got set that itch going. Um, so it was always going to be my goal. That's what I always wanted to get to. So I kind of got through the Ginetta ranks and, and, and had opportunities to go off and race Porsche, um, go off and do GTs. You know, I had I kind of I was at that point at the end of 2013 where I was at I was at the I was at the base of the ladder with sort of three or four ladders going up. So you could go this way, this way, this way, you know. So I had various options that I could have gone. Um, into some great drives and GTs and Porsche and all sorts of stuff, but it was touring cars that I wanted to do, and that was that for me was um, that for me was the easy easy route that I that I wanted to do. It was an easy choice for me. Well, very quickly, I mean, you you, you then had a you've had you obviously had a fantastic career in touring cars. So for eight seasons now, exactly where where all the time yeah. goes. Yeah. But um, you've had some. But just I'll quickly go back to one thing because it's always been a struggle with money. It's always been something that you know it's always hard for every driver. But obviously, some you know more than most. But I would say in the paddock, definitely, you're as, as well as being a fantastic driver and a, and a great talent in the car. You're also recognised as someone who is commercially savvy. You have a really good understanding of of what happens. Do you think that's something to do with? it being hard work to find the money to go racing so it makes you a little bit hungrier if you like off the track as well as on the track um i think you're probably not far wrong to be honest when you when you don't have it available to you in terms of finances to go racing you have to find it, you have to graft for it i think it does make you appreciate it more and it does make you understand how you have to find ways to get it and uh you know one of the things i started doing quite early on i'd have been 14, no, a little bit older, 15, got to say 15 or 16. I used to go along to uh, little business networking events, coffee okay. and morning, breakfast clubs. And I used to go and do talks, I used to go and do little meeting, meet and greets, talks and that sort of stuff, basically to try and fill up a little black book of contacts. Because yeah. once I had those contacts, if I knew one person and he spoke to two people, and well, I've got a few people, if I knew 100 people and they all spoke to one or two people, my network is growing massively. And that for me was quite early on that I wanted to do. So I've always had a bit of an interest in that. But, you know, the financial side of it, you're absolutely right, is key to, to any sport, any business. That's the biggest part. It's the biggest hurdle that anyone faces. But it's come to the point over the last few years that it's grown and grown and grown and grown and grown into a business in itself that um, without Laura, 
my yeah. girlfriend, we wouldn't be doing it. It's a full-time occupation for Laura and I. Um, and, you know, Laura works tirelessly at it and uh, is amazing. So between the two of us, we make a great little team um, and we're expanding that team. We're growing it. It's getting bigger. We, you know, we're bringing people in and it's, um, it's exciting. I think, that's right. the, I think that's one of the big things because people always look at the racing driver and they look at the person who's behind the wheel of the car and they don't really, I think, appreciate the team of people that they've got behind them. And, you know, Laura, you know, she helps out with the hospitality and everything on a weekend. She's in charge of all that. She's the one that, we know comes out with the uh, funny things on social media because clearly, you know, that's not something that you'll be doing. That's all going to be down to to Laura. But I mean, just how key is Laura to the success that you've had on track? Because, you know, there's a, a lot of drivers, I guess, it will be in the same boat as you, that without a strong partner behind them, they wouldn't yeah. be successful on track. Uh, 95% of it, if I'm honest, Matt, it really is. It's a huge part because um, we get so caught up Sean, you'll be guilty of this. Matt, you'll be guilty of this. We all get so caught up in the fine details of what is our little thing. I want to win. Mm -hmm. I don't care about anything else. I just want to win. But what you soon discover, actually, is there's bigger things, there's more important things than winning. And for me, winning is still the most important thing possible. However, where we are with Laura, Laura has the, um, the, 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 the sort of the knowledge and the, and the ability to go, that's great. However, this is the important stuff. And that's the, that's the key that we can both bounce off is I get carried away with the, with, the, with the numbers and I get carried away with looking at this and looking at this and looking at this. And sometimes actually this is the important stuff that needs going to do. And that's the bit that, that we bounce off together really, really well. And as I say, that's growing, um, but that goes right the way through all the way to the merchandising that we're doing and all the other stuff that we're doing, the social media stuff that's going on. It's, you know, it's, it's mad. It's full, as I say, it's full time for the, for the, for the both of us at the minute. And it's, and that's growing out to more people as well. So it's, um, yeah, it's busy. And unfortunately the cool bit, the driving around in circles bit is only the smallest bit, you know, I'd like yeah. to do it all the time, but actually it's the, uh, it's all the important stuff that has to go on to enable you to drive around in circles in the first place. Well, and I guess because, you know, you're not just seen now as Tom Ingram, the racing driver, kind of through the years, you know, you've been very savvy on the commercial side, but you've been very savvy on like the social media side of things. You know, you've got Tingram effectively now uh, as a brand. I mean, how important has that side of things been to kind of expand you as a person beyond just being a racing driver? Yeah, I think it's important. I think it's hugely important because... Um... I don't really want to be known just as a, yeah, of course, I want to be known as the, as the most successful Turco driver. At the minute, I'm eight years in and I haven't really achieved that, but it will happen. Um, but there's, as I say, there's bigger things at play than, than winning races and that sort of stuff. And growing the Tingwin brand has been amazing because I've loved doing it. I've loved what, we, what we're doing over race weekends with, you know, seeing people walking around in the merchandise, seeing people uh, so passionate about it, seeing the interactions that we're getting across social media. It's fantastic. And really for me, the Tingram, uh, the Tingram brand is something that, that I'm really excited by. It's something that is cool. Like I say, it's not, it's not just a racing drive, but there's other bits and pieces that's coming to it that, again, is going to grow over the, next, uh, over the next few years. It's going to go bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's, um, it's, you know, it's something that, that I was taught quite early on, actually, by, um, by Mr. Plato. That was one of his. Uh, that was one of his snippets of advice for me when I was racing in Genetics. Is just sort of say, get your brand, start growing that, because that's an important side to it. And he's absolutely right. And how, important, well, yeah. how important was Jason to your touring car career? Because obviously you were part of the KX Academy when that ran a few years ago. Was the commercial side of racing maybe the biggest thing you took away from working with Jason? I think so. Um, as I say, Jason is is uh, Jason probably like me. Or I'm probably like Jason in a number of areas that um, we're racing drivers and we want to win. And thankfully, we've got clever people and great people around us to uh, to work with as well. So um, you know, it is an important side to it. But for people who didn't know, so back in 2012 and 2013, when I was racing in Genetas, uh, Jason launched his KX Academy. Um, and I was one of the first people to, to jump in on that and got selected. Um, and that at the time was to basically was to top up your budget. So I was, or I was say 20 grand short, more or less. There'd be more, there'd be 
less than some people, but say in a region you were 20 grand less, you, you were 20 grand short in your budget. The idea of the KX Academy was to top up what you were short so you could finish the season. But in doing so, they would also give you mentoring. So you'd be, you'd have Jason with you. You'd have Jason at the end of a phone if you needed him. You'd have uh, media training. You'd have uh, sponsorship work. You'd have all sorts of bits and pieces, brand building, you know, loads of stuff that was going on. Um, and I just sucked it up. I was like a sponge. I just tried to take on as much information as possible. I went in um, with no expectations as to what am I going to get out of it, but just with an open mind going straight in, going, give me as much information as I can get. I want to be the annoying guy that is asking questions all the time to get as much information as possible. Um, and that was hugely important because you just you just pick stuff up, you know, you just little snippets, little throwaway snippets. You think, ah, oh, actually, that's information. That's useful. That's useful. That's useful. Um, and you just start to build this sort of back catalogue of information that that helps take you through. And that's not just on track. It's not just commercial, but it's all of the behind the scenes stuff. It's how you're working with people. Um, it's how you're saying stuff on TV interviews. It's how you. It's just all the all the important stuff actually that that is. Um, it was really important and again I'll be hugely grateful for, for, for Jason for giving me that opportunity um it was a it was a it was a really important stage of my career as well right before I entered touring cars is to get all of the all of that sort of experience if you know a shortcut of experience if you want to call it that of, of just stuff to pick up on that was um that was really good yeah, and I mean, J Jason really, actually, there are quite a few people who got involved with that, but I think you were the only guy who won a championship from, from the, the scholarship side then. So that sort of stands you out from the crowd a little bit. Uh, maybe. Um, yeah, maybe so. I think, as I say, I think I put in a huge amount of work and effort to that as well to try and make the best of an opportunity. Because as you know, Sean and, and, and Matt yourself, um, great opportunities don't come along that often in motorsport. Opportunities do, but not great opportunities. So when you get given those great opportunities, you maximise them. And the idea is to um, get everything, absolutely milk it for everything you can, get as much information as you can out of it. Um, because once that has gone, trying to get information like that is impossible. So once you've got the opportunity, you absolutely take it for everything it's worth. And yes, you're right that maybe I was the only one that came off the championship with it. But at the time, um, that was where the whole winning is important. Sometimes there's bigger things uh, at play as well that are just as important as well. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the big thing that was impressed me out of that is I don't know many 14 or 15 year olds who'd have the the nous and the confidence to go to breakfast meetings with lots of business people. So fair play to you, to be honest. I didn't know about that. And that's, yeah, uh, I mean, that, that, that makes was probably me that annoying. I was probably that annoying, precocious 14-year-old that no one actually liked, but just had to tolerate him because he was there. So what's changed then? Nothing. I've got older. <laughs> I've got more maybe, lines than maybe, it was just the, maybe it was just the kid at 15. They threw him a few quid to get him to go away. That's probably what it was. Just, you know, like a, like a sort of, just give him anything. To be fair, it was probably the tea and biscuits that brought me along, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's hope so let's hope so so then going back to your touring car side so you, you've you've had that sort of kick start to your career really with the kx academy coming off the Ginetta side into touring cars but and then when you look at it you, you went in with speedworks who you had a fantastic relationship and fantastic working relationship with but it took a few years for you to you know obviously showed your pace and showed the potential if you like but do you think there's quite a lot to learn in touring yeah. cars before you can really sort of start exploiting your natural speed if you like 100 people don't appreciate that um how hard it actually is and i'd argue now it's even more difficult um than it than it maybe was I'm not saying it was easy then i mean my first year 2014 was the year of the seven previous champions so we had Menu was back, Giovinardi was back, we had a load of big names. I think I qualified sixth on my first race weekend. So I was, you know, to go into my first race weekend, I was over the moon. Qualified sixth and the, and the previous champions ahead of me, I was mega. And um, it, is a, it is an immensely tough championship. People really don't appreciate it because you can be the best driver around, but if you haven't got the best car at the same time or you haven't quite got your setup optimized against the other people, it's difficult. It really, really is difficult. So you soon discover that actually you being a quick driver isn't going to make the difference. It's a part of it, but actually what you need to do is work as a team. You need to have the right people around you. 
you need to work with the people that are around you to improve the products that you have, i.e. the car. Make that as good as you can be. And this is where over the years you see um, you see these fluctuations. You see some people come, you see some people go, you see some people go, you know, you see some names pop up and then disappear. And having that consistency over a period of time is difficult because so much of it is about getting the car right, but also having the right team, having the right engineer, having the right everything linked together at once is, is hard. And that's the, that's the hardest part. The other difficult thing to do is, is from a is from a psychological point of view, um, because it's tough it, it, in the sense that you're not going to win all three. And having this, you know, the function in your brain to accept at some point you can have a bad race, but it's going to come back your way. So when we had the, the weight, it was horrible, it was a horrible thing. But it used to really play with you. You would it would, it was a it was a real mental game whereby you'd turn up and you'd go your first few laps in practice and the car would feel mega. You go, this is mint, really good. Yeah, right, we'll go from the first flyer. Mint, hook that one up. And your engineer comes over the radio and says, mega lap, mate, you're P18. <laughs> oh, oh no. Oh no, this is difficult. But to have the ability to go, it's this big lump of church roof that sat in the passenger seat of the car that's slowing me down. It will come back. That is That was the hardest part. So, so much about touring cars was about the head game, staying strong, knowing that it's going to come back to you, not get panicked, not stress about things you've got no control over. And I've actually done quite a lot of work over the years um, with a performance coach in that area as well to, to open that side up. Um, and that was enormously helpful, really. I started working with him back in 2018, um, and it just changes things. It's, it was amazing the difference that having someone uh, just on that side of the fence to go, this is how to do it, this is what not to do, this is how to, um, was, was massive. And that really helped me and continues to help me moving forwards now. I, th I think that's, I think you're completely right. I think but it's all very well being quick, which you need to be, that has to happen. But it's quite easy for a quick driver to throw their toys out the pram if their head's not in the right place. And then suddenly everything goes to pop. It doesn't matter how quick you are. If, you, if you're making silly decisions on track, then that's not going to work, is it? It's, it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be, a, that's not the long game. The long no. game, I mean, probably Colin Turkington is probably the best. I mean, I've, I've never worked closely with Colin until this year working with the West Surrey side of stuff, but seeing he just he's sort of slightly unfazed by everything. It's, yeah, it's I mean he is I mean genuinely he is quite a boring character, isn't he? <laughs> I wouldn't say that at all. He's actually quite a laugh actually. <laughs> but the outside he's just quite he's just very it just takes everything That's as it right. Comes. But so much of that is experience as well. And yeah. again that takes you on to your next point is that it took me two years before I got my first um my first win. You know, so yeah. much of that is experience. Yeah. And once you've got that experience, it chills you out. So now we're going to Silverstone. I feel so chilled. I don't feel any stress. I don't feel any pressure. I don't feel nervous. Because you know that it's the, you've, you've got what you've got. You can make tweaks. You can try to improve what you've got now. But fundamentally, what we've got is what we've got. So there's no point stressing about it. No point getting worried. I've got to do the best job I can. I know my team around me will do the best job they can. Um, we're in it now this is what we've got so let's see let's just see and that is experience and that's where Colin has been fantastic at over the years is to have that ability to um stay level-headed and like I say I joke he's very boring he's not but it's that it's that ability to just be completely level-headed not be phased not get worried we've seen him make mistakes over the years we've seen Jake mate uh, Ash mate me mate we've all made mistakes over the years as as you know going into the final weekend of the year but it's the ability to just stay level-headed that's so important, I think. No, you definitely. said about how relaxed you feel going to Silverstone. I mean, how much of that comes from having such a settled team around you? Because, you know, you've got Spencer as your engineer who you've worked with for a good few years now. And I guess there's probably times when you get out of the car and go back to the truck for the debrief, and you probably don't need to say to Spencer how things have gone. You'll just need to give him a look and he'll know 
exactly what you're thinking. I, yeah. How important is that side of things? Because if you look at the drivers who were successful at the front, you know, you've got Spencer, uh, Ash Sutton's got, you know, Tony Carrots alongside him. They're the drivers who've got that strong relationship with their engineer who are ultimately successful. I, I think it's a massively underappreciated thing um, is, is that because, as I say, it, it, it's not just a case of me driving as, as well as I possibly can. I aim to do that every time I get in the car, of course, as does every driver. But if you've not got the car in the right place, me driving as fast as possible won't make a difference. So that relationship with driver and engineer is hugely important because ultimately it's the engineer's call, but you've got to have the right relationship in the first place. You've got to have the right understanding to know that when I say I've got a bit of understeer, I've got a bit of oversteer, it does this, it does that, you've got, we've all got your little black book of tweaks. We, we all know doing one of them or taking one of them out or putting one of them in affects certain parts of the car. But that's not what it always wants. And that's not what it always needs in that regard as well. So having the ability to work with an engineer, um, as in my case, I'm enormously privileged to work with somebody like Spencer, who for me is uh, a massive inspiration to me at his um, incredible work ethic and his ability to communicate in that, in that sense is fantastic. Um, so Spencer for me is uh, part of that team, you know, not just to, to, I'm not talking accelerate, I'm talking team as in team Tingham, if you like, of very, very important people who keep the wheels turning, pardon the pun, but also uh, is able to, to uh, make the job that we do better. And I think Spencer is amazing at that. He really, really is fantastic. And um, I would be very stuck without Spencer, I'll be honest, because he's, um, he's just got an incredibly calming way about him, as engineers seem to do. But I just love the fact that, that I can communicate exactly like you said there, Matt. I can communicate with Spencer by not even talking. I don't even need to talk. I can get out of the car. He knows how I've unclipped my radio how I feel, what I want. He knows just about the lap time that I produced on lap two, what I'm going to say, how I'm going to say it. And that, for me, is is absolutely critical. Really, really is critical. No, that's right. I mean, it's, it's interesting, is it? Because just going back a step a little bit, so you had a fantastic relationship and great success with Speedworks through the various toy, you know, the events and then the Corolla. And I've got to say, one of the, just, just I, I've never really spoke to you about it, but that's one of the shocks for me of, of, of when suddenly I heard, oh, you heard that Tom Ingram is, is moving, he's going to accelerate, or he's, or he's talking about, you know, blah, and I went, right, okay, no, uh, no, all right, well, that, that's, that was a shock. So, I mean, how, how did that come about? Yeah, so it was, it was a strange time because we'd obviously got to the end of the, dreaded 2020 season and um things are all you know sort of building up we've done a great job we, you know on track results were fantastic off track results were were getting better ginsters were absolutely loving it toyota were absolutely loving it we were always running as a one car team so it was always quite difficult in that sense to get um to get sort of commercial um agreements in place whereby everyone's happy um, and it was coming further and further through the season. I knew that Ginsters were, were enormously pleased with what was going on and were going to continue and, and you know, go from strength to strength. I also knew, uh, or later found out as we were going in towards the off season, that Toyota's involvement was looking to increase. Um, at the point, they came to that point at the same time. Ginsters wanted what they were getting, but Toyota also wanted that. It wasn't going to work. Now, rather than offering both parties a lesser product and ultimately a worse product off the back of it, um, it, it was the right, ultimately it was the right thing to do. You know, not from a, a selfish point of view. I've got to look after myself. Christian and Amy at Speedworks, they've got to look after themselves. There's no disagreement. We still talk away. We still text each other. We're still mates. But it's a commercial business. It's a business sense. And as we all know, like you just picked up on earlier on, Sean, that money is the most important factor within all of this. And sometimes it's a horrible thing to have to do, but sometimes it's the best thing to do um, was to go your separate ways in that regard. And, um, you know, like I say, I'm, I'm, you know, hold the years that I did at Speedworks with, a, with enormous amount of, of, of pride and satisfaction, as I'm sure, um, as I'm sure Christian does as well. But 
it was um, it was unfortunately just a timing thing. And uh, it was a shame, of course it was, because we had a good few years and, and we were doing amazing things. But um, as we all know, the old cliche, everything comes to an end eventually. And uh, that was the point. But uh, it was... Um, it was a it was a weird off season for me. It was a really really weird, weird off season to have to start talking to other teams. I felt like I was having an affair almost um, having to talk with different teams. But um, you know, ultimately, where where we moved to in for the twenty twenty one season, accelerate was amazing, and you know, I, I loved the move. Continue to love love uh, love the team that I'm working with. So, you know, the, the Christians obviously managed to get two good drivers with. Roy and Ricky, you know, I've managed to go off and get a great drive with Accelerate. So, you know, all, to, to, all, you know, to almost put it that, you know, it's kind of ended, it's ended all right in a roundabout sort of way. And I think yeah. it was an interesting career choice because, you know, you were a driver who was consistently fighting for the championship. So, you know, if you'd asked any team boss up and down the paddock, if they wanted Tom Ingram in a car, they would probably have said yes. So I think when it was announced that you were going to join Justina at Accelerate, there would have been people who looked at it and thought, why is he going there? The team's never won a race. They're only a few years old. But there's a lot of parallels there with you going to Speedworks because, of course, when you joined Speedworks, they weren't the race-winning team that they are now. And kind of you've helped two teams now effectively to make that progress up the grid. Yeah, and I think that's, um, you know, in that off-season period, in that 20, you know, the end of 2020 and getting into 2021, I had offers from, from every team on the grid. Um, you know, I could have joined anyone, but it was, uh, yeah, as I said to you earlier on, there's some important factors that, that come into play within, within the whole agreement of driving for a team. You know, it's not just a case of, um, you know, have they got the best car to win? For me, that's the most important part. But ultimately, there's some, there's some increasingly important factors within that in terms of, of um, have I got the right product to offer my partners? Um, you know, have I got the right you know, ability to, to, to be able to make and earn money out of it. You know, so many factors that are important, but from a um, uh, sort of a headspace point of view for me as well, Chris is a great friend who I can really rely on his information as a sounding board. Now, he'll tell me as it is. If I'm wrong, he'll just tell me. If I'm right, he'll tell me, but in a great way. So I spent a huge amount of time in the off season chatting with Chris. Chris came to every meeting that I was going with and, and was um, was a hugely important sounding board in that whole process to make sure that we made the right decision. And um, as I say, I think it's turned out really, really well because like you say, Matt, we've been able to join Accelerate, take a first win in, was it the third race weekend um, of joining the first, you know, first podium on the first, um, first race of the year. So it was great to sort of go in and, and of course, um, you know, be able to continue to work with Spencer as well, because that was that for me was a was a big part of that as well. Interesting that you mentioned Chris there, because you know we've had drivers through the years who've had long term relationships with sponsors. You know, Andrew Jordan and Pertec is probably the best example. But in that case, we had a Pertec branded car racing around on track for years. Everyone knew it. The Hansford stickers have been on your cars for a lot of years, but they're not always the biggest stickers. But, you know, that, that support's been there throughout the years. There's probably not many sponsors like Chris and Leslie who are there every race weekend, who are there with you for testing. How important have they been to you get into this stage? As I say, you know, I, I mentioned Lawrence Tomlinson earlier on as a sort of saying, you know, there's been a lot of people that have helped me over the years. Chris is probably the biggest one of that in terms of, in terms of, a, um, in terms of my career progression. And as I say, not just financially because that's obviously a hugely important side to it but just the ability to have somebody in your corner who understands you as well and as I say Chris is a Chris is a fantastic friend um as as Leslie are as well you know we spend huge amounts of time with Chris and Leslie um and I'll be really stuck without them because Chris knows you know how how I can work technically with Spencer in that regard of how I disconnect the radio he knows if I've got oversteer or understeer how I disconnect the radio, Chris already knows where my headspace is at and has the ability to be able to communicate on a level with me um, that either mellows me, gets me fired up for what I need to do, can change what I need to. Um, again, it's hugely important. It's a relationship thing. You know, I say this all the time. Having a relationship within a team and a, and a, and a group of people is the most important thing yes you need a good car yes you need a good driver 
but having good people around you who can communicate well um, and have a good solid um, sounding board where you can have open conversations and, and say that didn't work, that did work. Sensible conversations to never disagree um, it is so important. It really, really is. And, and you know, to have somebody like Chris and Leslie fighting my corner as well, I would, I, I would, and I continue to say would be stuck without them in that sense because they're a, they're a huge part of that that team Tingram bubble um, that continue to that continue to keep it growing. So we're going to Silverstone this weekend for the, the first of the, the last two meetings of the year. Silverstone's been a happy hunting ground for you. Always gone well. One thing I've always noticed with a car, any car you've driven, you always seem to come off really well out of the hairpin at Beckett's. And again, that's all sort of diff work and traction and set up. So, I mean, is, is there anything specific that you do for Silverstone or is it just a, is it a case of a, a little bit of everything? We dust off the Silverstone setup, Sean. <laughs> and on it goes, and that's it. It doesn't matter what, what touring car it is, on it, on it goes. Pretty much. Just bolt that on. Um, no, it's, it's a case of a huge amount of work over the years. And again, I'll be honest with you, Sean. So when, um, when Spencer and I joined Accelerate, I think the good part of that, and I like this, is when we got that win at Snetterton in the, in the whatever round it was, around two, three, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Everyone would have gone, you just bolted the same setup on as you had on the Corolla. And we didn't. It was so different and is now. It, it, what Spencer and I know or knew from when we were at Speedworks, we, we're, not, we're not really doing anything, I'll be honest. We're so far away from what we were doing then because we've learned, we've improved, as the grid has. If you look around now, the lap times that we're generating at the same cars that have been around since the Stone Ages are amazing. If you look at, we've still got the same fundamental parts as we had back in 2016, was it? And yeah. you look at the lap times now, they're so fast. Yes, we've got a bit of hybrid. Yes, we've gone up in weight. But look at the weight of the cars and the lap times that we're generating are phenomenal. I mean, it is ridiculous how much faster we are over the last few years. And the, um, the ability to be able to keep reinventing ourselves and to keep changing what we're doing and keep improving what we're doing is amazing and I think that's where I'm continually inspired by Spencer at the work ethic because he hasn't just gone yeah we've got a quick car we'll just leave it as is it's not that at all it's you know it, even if even when we qualified pole at Alton we were still there till half past eight nine o'clock at night going through what can we improve what can we do better how do we make it even better um so yes Silverstone has been a, a great circuit for me over the years that has served me really really well um, but I'm not going in going, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's been great for me over the years, so it'll be good again, because it continues to get better. The, the, the championship grows, the, 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 um, the opposition get better, the drivers get better, the cars get better. So you can't ever assume that you're going to go in and be fast. So it just means that the work that Spencer and I and, and Bradley and everyone back at base have been doing over the last few weeks um, has been hugely important, ready for when we roll out for free practice one, that will be in good shape. And I think that's, um, it's important, but you're absolutely right. It is a circuit that, that has served me well. It's a circuit that I enjoy. And it's also a massively underappreciated circuit because everyone goes, well, there's only four corners, ain't that difficult? Far from the truth. There's four corners. So any idiot can drive it. So how do you drive it better than anyone else? And that's what I love. That's what I love, the ability to be able to look into these finite fingertip stuff is, Qualifying is probably, probably three tenths qualifying the, you know, over the top 15 or something stupid. So how do we find half a tenth? That's the bit I like. And the stats back up, you know, Tom's success, because if you look back through the years, 2016, he was on the podium at Silverstone. He's been on the podium at least once on a weekend every season since. Um, you know, 11 podiums there. He's only had more podiums at Brands Hatch, but then we go to Brands Hatch twice in a season. We only go to Silverstone once. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a strong record. And if he maintains it this weekend, he's going for that 60th career podium as well. So there's a little landmark you could get this weekend, Tom. No pressure. There's no pressure at all. I, it was, I said I was really chilled for the weekend. Now I'm stressing. I'm nervous. So that those those podium stats there show that you're really strong at Silverstone, really strong at Brandsatch, two pretty dissimilar sort of circuits, which is, is great for you. But what it also points is you're looking pretty strong, aren't you, to head to Brands and, and be in with a good shout at the top? 
I feel more chilled than I ever have done. I think we've got a better car than I ever have done. I feel honestly, I feel in great shape. I feel in really, really good shape. Um, I, I'm excited. If anything, I'm not nervous. I'm, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. I'm wanting to get going because uh, the the last two circuits, uh, two of my favourite circuits, the two of the circuits I've gone well at over the years. It's getting a bit cooler to take that advantage away from those uh, those rear wheel drive cars. So it's good. It's in good shape, honestly. I, I'm, I'm up for it. I'm so up for it. It's um it's going to be great. It's um I think qualifying is going to be massively important come uh, come Silverstone. I think that might make or break what's going on. Let's wait and see what happens. You can see there the enthusiasm that you've got for the last two rounds. You know we know that you've won independence championships, you want to get that overall title. I mean, I, I guess the key question is if you were able to get to the end of race three at, at Brands Hatch and have them taking you onto the podium to be crowned as BTCC champion, do you think it would be the, the thing that would finally make Marvin smile in the in the arm? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> There's two things I found that make Marvin smile. Um, firstly is uh, five o'clock when he gets to go home. And the second one is when he gets a pint of Stella. They're the two things that seem to make Marvin smile. Bless him. I, I love Marvin to bits. He's um, our TM is is um, how many how many years has he has he been been touring cars now, Matt? You do you know that? He's probably been in it more years than he's not. Twenty five years. He was he was team manager when I used to go. My mate Chris Goodwin used to race a Cavalier back then. I think Mark. I think Marvin was his team. Was he his team manager? I can't remember now. But he's been but he's been involved. Too many years. Honestly, but what a guy. I absolutely love him to bits. Um, and even on, on some hero, really, Sandra as well. It's kind of, yeah. she's on the family element that you've talked about a few times. Really is. And again, that's that, um, you know, Marv is a, is, a, is a great person to have around because um, it goes back to that experience thing that we spoke about earlier on, Sean. He's, he's got the ability to be able to backdate information of relevance in the sense that when we did this in 1999 or when we did this in 2009 or just bits of stupid little snippets that you can relate back to and go ah oh, yeah that's a good point we didn't think about that stuff like that is important and uh he's just a, he's just a great guy to have around uh, however many years he's been in it, 113 years that he's been in the touring car championship now his enthusiasm is just as strong and if it just doesn't show it. It just doesn't, no. But what I love about that is that he's um, he's incredibly gracious when it goes as well, but even when it doesn't, he's incredibly gracious. But the, the important factor with that is when he's had a disservice done to him, steer clear. Because he is, he is he, his, his morals are amazing. You know, I think that's, the, that's a great way to look at it, is that he's maybe of that... Um, He's definitely of the, of the, and he won't mind me saying this, he's of the generation of, of, um, of the gentleman's agreement and the, and the sort of the base stop of truths, based off of facts, but based off of trust and, uh, and honesty. And I love that. You know, for me, they're, they're morals that I share as well. And I think that's why I get on so well with him is because we can both see eye to eye on certain things. Um, we can both agree on nearly everything that, that, that is said. But I know that if something's been done that isn't right, Marvin will be the first one up back in my, you know, back, back in my corner. Um, that I think is a, is, is a, is a really important thing to have. Really, really and, important. and the kind of person where if you get called up to the bus, you'd rather have him on your side than on the other oh, side. Undoubtedly so. Undoubtedly so. I mean, I'm scared of Marvin at the best of times. Um, I wouldn't want to be on, I wouldn't want to be going against him, that's for sure. So going back to this, the championship fight that we've got coming up, it does look like it's going to, well, it's, it's definitely you four. Josh has got, which is, is, is yourself, Jake Hill, Colin Turkington, Ash Sutton. You've got to say that sort of cold temperatures and a damp sort of Silverstone or brands. I'm not sure what the weather's going to be like. It's not too bad at the moment for Silverstone by the look of it. But, you know, you're, you're in a strong position. So teammates then come into into interview, and you've got to look at maybe the BMWs are, are sort of splitting their bat a little bit. But yeah. you've got Ash Sutton now, who's definitely got his wingman, Dan Camish, on his side, having sort of swapped places at Thruxton, which is the, quite the right thing to do. And and I suppose, you, have you got a similar relationship with Dan Lloyd as your teammate? I mean, obviously you've got a couple of other teammates, but they're still still learning their trade, if you like. But Dan is your, is your wingman, to say. 
yeah, obviously, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in a great place where I have got, you know, three other, three other teammates to play with as well. You know, particularly with, with Dan and particularly with Tom as well, is, you know, they can both be in the mix. You know, Jack, even, you know, even when we look at last year, Jack was quick at Silverstone as well. So, you know, I'm hopeful that actually coming into this weekend, we, we, can, um, we can hopefully have a sort of a four strong uh, link arms head down, shoulders out, elbows out, charge, attack. Um, that is kind of what we need to do, you know, to stand a chance at the at the Drivers' Championship. You know, I'm going to need some brothers in arms at the same time uh, for the Drivers' Championship as well, uh, or for the Team Championship, sorry, as well. It's going to be a hugely important weekend. So, yeah, you know, to have Dan and, and, and Tom, uh, you know, up up there as well, and, and Jack right up there as well will be will be fantastic. So, yeah, let's let's wait and see how that pans out. But... You're absolutely right. It's getting into that that nail biting part of the year where those extra couple of points that you missed out on back in Donington suddenly you start to notice. And um, you know, we saw Jake and we saw Colin have a bit of a scuffle at, uh, at the early stages of the season. I doubt that's the last we'll see of that as the season, as the as the championship starts to hot up because it's a difficult situation for the both of them. They're both teammates, but they're both going for the title as well. So there's going to be a bit of an inter-team battle going on there, which I hope continues to uh, to bubble up. Um, we've got Ash and Dan. You know, they're, they're going to be wingmen there. They're going to be fighting with each other. Ash has been here before. He knows the score. But it's the first time he's probably had to fight against a real drive car when he's maybe not had the quickest car to be able to fight against. So Ash is going to be desperate for it. But, you know, I feel in a good place in the sense that... Um, you know, I've been here for, for however many years, I think it's my fifth year going into the, you know, hopefully going into that final weekend of the year in contention. But even these last two or three rounds, just knowing whereabouts you are in the championship and having that awareness of the other people you're fighting against is really important. And I think we'll, we'll see how it plays out at Silverstone. I think the most important part of the weekend is going to be Saturday, Saturday afternoon going into qualifying. You know, if we if there's one of us, one of us four, I'll say, that has maybe dropped down the pack a little bit, I'd always be ruling us out, to be honest. I think it's, um, I think Saturday qualifying is going to be, is going to be hugely important. It's going to be key. Well, thanks very much for everything, having a good chat, some really good information there, and, and a few ideas for younger drivers coming through of what it, what it takes to be a professional racing driver. So good luck at the weekend. I've got a funny you. feeling you're the sort of guy who makes his own luck. So sort of, um, you know, I think that you work hard behind the scenes to make sure that, that luck becomes quite a small part of it. But good <laughs> luck for the next two meetings and, Thank and thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, guys. No, thank you very much for having me. I'll, uh, I'll catch you around soon. Thank you. Cheers.